The text for our message this morning comes to us from Isaiah chapter 44. Housed in the Galleria del Academia in Florence, Italy, is the statue, the David. The David was created by Michelangelo in 1504. He sculpted it to perfection. The, the beauty of the human form. David stands 17 foot tall, towering over any other statues around him. The statue is made of white marble. Is a beautiful figure standing bold and blazing. Now, I've never been to Italy to actually witness the David. I've only seen him in pictures and on the internet um, in magazines. However, I'm told that leading up to the David in the Galleria del Academia are statues, several statues right in a row. However, these statues, unlike the David, they've not taken form yet. In fact, they're, some of them are about halfway through. Some of them are barely at all formed. Some of them look much like men and women, but some of them look more like a, a, a cube of rock, a cube of marble, waiting to be shaped and formed. Now, as much as I'd like to immediately run down the hallway and go to the David and look at that beauty, beautiful statue, I think we should pause for a minute in this hallway. Look at these statues that so, many, so often people just run right past. Stop and look at these unformed, these grotesque figures. Stop and look at them and, and imagine for a moment what they must look like. Why didn't the author, the sculptor, the one whose hand was put to it, why didn't he finish them? Why did he leave them as they were? What does this have to do with my life? Well, I think as we look at those sculptures, those partially finished sculptures, well, we're forced to look a little bit at our view of God. Not only our view, but the, the world's view of God, and our, or the world's view of Jesus. Think about it. Oftentimes, when we look upon God, when we look upon Jesus, we have this incomplete view. We have this unformed view. We have this malformed view, this view that is, that is left with spots. And it's not as if it's a new thing. Consider the Old and the New Testament. Oftentimes, we are given different attributes of God at different places, aren't we? We're told that God is the creator God. In another spot, we're told he's the God, a jealous God. We're told that he is a God who is a righteous God, a holy God, a judge. We're told that he is a loving God, a merciful God. We have all these different aspects of God that show up in Scripture and beyond what I just shared. And so at times, I think it's not so hard to believe that the world or that we can have a, well, that our formation, our view of God is a bit incomplete. Today in our Old Testament le lesson, God himself asks a rhetorical question, and you can see almost a, a slight bit of humor in, in his question. He asks, who is like me? And then right at the end, there is no rock like me. There is no other rock. And it's interesting because when you think about it, of course, what do we make idols of oftentimes? How do we make and form those idols in our lives? Well, maybe we don't do this today with rock or precious stones or gems, but Oh, did they do it in the Old Testament? When they formed these false images, these wrong images, they would do so out of rock and stone. And so God, with a, I almost picture a bit of a grin on his face, who is like me? What rock is there that is like me? And we know, thank the Lord, that there is not one. But where does this go with our lives? Now, some of you may say, well, I don't have a malformed view of God. I don't have a misinformed view of God. I know exactly who God is in my life. I know exactly what he is to look like. But do we? Well, oftentimes, there's a, one of our favorite images of God is, is, the God, is Jesus in the New Testament, isn't it? G Jesus is the God of love, the God who's brought peace, the one who has had mercy on us, who's given his life on the cross for us. One of our images that we celebrate on a regular basis here in church. But what if you were to go to a non-believer and only show them that image of God? Only show them that image that God is loving, that he is merciful. Well, these are certainly true aspects of God. Certainly these are accurate pictures of God. They're not completely accurate, are they? Think about the questions you would get. They'd be awful difficult. God, who is loving. God, who is merciful. God, who himself says, I am your friend, John 15. Well, what about when they ask you, this loving God. Why did he allow my daughter to get an abortion? Why did he 
allow my parents to lose their home because their income didn't keep up with the inflation? Why do I struggle with the stresses and difficulties of my family life? Where is that loving God? See, when we only show them one aspect of God, certainly a beautiful aspect of God, that love and mercy, we're not showing them a greater picture. And that is that our God is not only loving and merciful, but he is omnipotent or all-powerful. When we look at our all-powerful God, no, that doesn't answer the question to any of those questions they ask. But it does tell them that despite those things, our God is in control. Our God has all things within his hands. Romans 8.28 God works all things to the good of those who love Him. See, when we show only certain portions of God, when we look at only certain portions of God, it doesn't just, though, end there. Oftentimes, there's another extreme that we'll take, isn't there? We like to look at God as that judgmental God, so long as it's not turned on us. We like to look at God as that God of judgment who He looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, and they got what they deserved. He looked at that rich man, and he was just a little too rich the way he treated Lazarus. We look at him and we say, boy, those nations that are sinful, those nations that are wicked, oh, there's that island that hundreds of thousands of people got killed by an earthquake. They deserve that. They were sinners. Or we look at a city and we say, oh, those two planes that flew into those two towers, oh, they deserve that. Or we look down and we say, oh, that hurricane that hit and the flood that filled that city, oh, they deserve that. And we look and we sit in that sea of judgment. We take that seat from God and we say, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just telling you what's right. And we sit there and we judge. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me we don't do this. But we don't like that, though, when it turns on us, do we? We don't like when we are, sit, when we are sat before the judge, do we? And so when we only see that one aspect of God, we're missing out on the most important aspect. And that is that even as much as we are all sinners, that God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for us. That God did not just come for those people who look like us or smell like us or talk like us, but He came for all people. And how do we know that God in His omniscience, all-knowing nature, didn't come to those people allowing this to happen so that we could go to them and see that none of us are any different. We're all sinners in need of His mercy. See, the list could go on and on, couldn't it? It seems like even we as Christians at times, we like to have God in a certain light, in a certain way, and whatever suits us. But we know that those are incomplete ways, aren't they? We know that those ways, that when we look at them, that those are ways that are, are generated by our sinful human nature. We know that oftentimes those ways, they're not in line with what it says in God's holy word to us. And so it's like when we look at those unfinished statues. We don't see God in all His glory and all His grace because we can't. We can't look at that great God. That God who towers over time who looks upon us as his children. We can't look upon him because we are we are those unfinished statues. See, what I didn't tell you is those statues, as they lined those halls, they were intentionally left unfinished. Those statues, they were intentionally left incomplete. See, the artist, Michelangelo, as he shaped those statues and formed those statues, he had an eye on the human nature, on each of us. How many of us We have lived these broken lives, these grotesque lives, these incomplete lives, these broken lives. And we live in this imperfect world. But the beauty is the sculptor, he sees us as finished. He sees us as completed, not because of our works, not because of what we have done, not because of the shape or form we've taken in this life, no. But because of what he has done. Because he has sent that perfect sacrifice of Christ. Who is like our God? There is not one, is there? Who is like our God that we could even that we could even dare to approach him? On our own we wouldn't. But through Christ, through Christ, he opens that door to us. That we may see that as much as we are sinners, as much as at times we have twisted and tried to shape God in our image, that He is greater than that. He is perfect. He 
is holy. He's righteous. He demands the same of us, doesn't He? He demands that we live holy, perfect, righteous lives. As long as we're on this earth, we will never be able to, will we? We'll always be those incomplete statues, missing an arm, missing our eyes, missing legs. Not until the last day. When we come before God, when we go, when we go into His presence, not on our own, not walking on our own, but being carried in. See, our God, that beautiful, that beautiful, perfect God, He stepped down from His pedestal. He stepped down and He walked into our lives. He got His hands dirty. He reached out to those who were different, those who, who we thought, who weren't like us, but were indeed sinners just in need like us. He reached down from that pedestal and got off there and he reached into our lives and he picked us up. And then he got put back on the pedestal. But not like we would imagine. The pedestal of the cross. Put his hands up. Not in defeat, but in victory. And he hung there. Until after three days when he came he came out of that tomb. And He came to, into our lives with new life for each of us. So that all who are baptized can indeed look upon our God in perfection. Not as a God who hangs above us or stands above us. Not as a God who towers over time looking down upon us. But as a God who has indeed walked into our human lives. Who has stepped into our human form. Who has taken our human frailty and lifted it up to Himself. How beautiful that image is of our perfectly complete, glorified God stepping into our life. How beautiful it is to know that He took our broken lives and bound them up and put them together. How beautiful it is to know that He didn't want it to stop with us, though. But there are a lot of statues just like us out there, aren't there, that are broken, that have missing arms and missing legs, missing eyes, missing teeth. They have missing hearts that have been broken by society. And He sends us to them. He sends us as His missionaries to them. He sends us to go out to show them that beautiful glory of God. He sends us out to show them that as broken as they are, that they are not too broken for the Savior. They are not too broken for the one who asks, who is like me? Oh no, not one. Not one is like our God. And thank the Lord there isn't. Because the love of our Lord is greater than we could imagine. The love of our God stretches beyond our brokenness. Even to the hearts of those who do not yet know Him. Our mission. Our mission is not just to stay here. Comfortably in the walls. Protected with the beautiful artwork we have. But to go out. To share that word, to share that love. To go out and ask a nation who is full of sin, full of brokenness, who is like our God? And show them there is indeed no God like our God. There is no God like our God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have stepped down from, from your throne in heaven and you have come to be among us. We thank you that you have seen us as worthy and valuable enough to come into our lives to heal our broken hearts, to still our pains, and to lift us up to you. We pray that each day that we would look for opportunities that just as you have shared this love with us to go forth and share this love with others, to go forth and share this wonderful gift, this gift of your grace, this gift of your mercy, to go forth showing people that they are not too broken to be His. Showing people that they are not too sinful for His forgiveness. Showing people that one day all who know You will join You in life eternal. We pray this in Your Son Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.